Hi everybody, my name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. Welcome to the Big Book Cafe group of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is our Big Book study. Uh, this week we're starting on page 66 near the bottom of the page. Last week we were starting step four and we went through our resentment list. How to make the resentment list. We used the chart, the sample resentment list on page 65. We went through it with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, my employer, my wife. Talked about all the causes that we had anger against people and also what part of our lives it affected. So we worked on that. We realized that we have people, institutions, and principles that we're angry at. And over the years of drinking, we got angry over a lot of things. So we have a lot of anger. We need to correct that anger, take care of that anger, fix that. And the book says we need to get rid of anger, get rid of it altogether. And that's a hard thing to do, but the directions in the book make it so much easier, and, it's, and it makes it well worthwhile. So let's look at page 66 at the second full paragraph at the bottom. This is what the last little bit we read last week. It says, if we were to live, we had to be free of anger. The grouch and the brainstorm were not for us. They may be the dubious luxury of normal men, but for the alcoholic, these things are poison. So why, why are resentments poison to alcoholics? That was the question that came to my mind immediately. Well, it says, we turn back to the list where it held the key to the future. We were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. We began to see that the world and the people in it really dominated us. In that state, the wrongdoing of others, fancied or real, had the power to actually kill. How could we escape? We saw these resentments must be mastered, but how? We could not wish them away any more than alcohol. So, that statement of... Uh, the wrongdoing of others fancied were real had the power to actually kill. How does that work? What do you mean it has the power to actually kill? Well, it kills us because if we don't get rid of our anger, we're going to go out and get drunk. And if we get drunk, there's a good chance we'll die. Last week, I asked the group, how many people in the room know somebody who has died from alcoholism? And every person in the group raised their hand because it kills people. Alcoholism kills people. It messes up your body. It messes up your mind. It makes you make bad decisions and you do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, and it will kill you. You know, we have anger against people because of our thinking about people that our anger to them is, is fancied. It's not even real. We're mad at them for one reason or another, and we don't always know why. We have to get rid of these ang this anger. So how do we do that? It says, this was our course. We realized that the people who wronged us were perhaps spiritually sick. Though we did not like their symptoms, and the way these disturbed us, they, like ourselves, were sick too. And if you tell an alcoholic that he's spiritually sick, he'll go, yep, that's right. And we know that we're spiritually sick. That's why we're here. That's why we're working on step three and step two. That's why we're going to work on to see other things in our program because we are spiritually sick. And the book tells us early on, you know, once we fix the, the spiritual malady, the body and mind will follow suit. So we have to fix a spiritual malady, get rid of our anger, our resentments, our hatred, and get rid of that so that we can live free. And we do that by working on our four-step list and dealing with each one of those resentments as they come through. 
And so we didn't like how other people acted sometimes. People were a pain in the butt. They drove us crazy. But these people are sick too. So what did we do? And here's probably one of the most important parts in your recovery, the way to get yourself in a better place is to do as follows. It says, we ask God to help us show the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. We ask God. That means we talk to God. When we talk to God, we're praying. So this is a prayer. We pray to God to help us show them the same tolerance, pity, and patience that we would cheerfully grant a sick friend. If we have a friend of ours that has COVID, or a friend of ours that has cancer, or a friend of ours that has something else wrong with them, do we get mad at them for having that disease? Do we get mad at them for the way they behave because they're in pain and discomfort? No, we love them. They're our friends, they're our relatives. We love them and we coddle them and we try to make them feel better and we'll do anything to help them out. But not so with people that we have resentments against. People that we have resentments against, we don't even want to talk to them. And when we talk to them, we're arguing. We don't want to do that. That takes us away from the sunlight of the Spirit. And, and remember, last week we also read that on page 66 in that first full paragraph, it says, but with the alcoholic whose hope it is the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, this business of resentment is infinitely great. So our purpose here is to be able to maintain and grow our spiritual experience. And in most cases, that happens bit by bit, little by little. Once in a while, you make a gain on it. But it takes doing these things, like praying for our for people that are our enemies, the people that we have resentments against. We have to pray for those people. It says, when a person offended, we said to ourselves, this is a sick man. How may I be helpful to him? God, save me from being angry. Thy will be done. Now, would you think that God's will for us is to be angry and yelling and screaming and being mean to people who are sick in one way or another. Of course not. That's a, a time when a friend or another person in our lives needs our help or needs our understanding or needs one of our principles, tolerance, patience, understanding, acceptance, all those things. It, it, those are the things that that person needs. And we have to ask God to help us do that because it's not easy. It's just not easy. We say this prayer and we're thinking about the person. So that person is in our mind and we're going down our resentment list one person at a time and saying this prayer. Um, we used to make up a sheet called the, a resentment, the resentment prayer, the sick man prayer list. And you put everybody on your resentment list, on this list, and you started praying for them. And you prayed for them every day for two weeks. You prayed for them every day until the resentment went away. Some people, it only took a week. Some people, it took a month. Some people, we're still praying for it. After all these years, we're still praying for it because we just can't get rid of the resentment. But we're working on it. We're trying. Progress, not perfection. So we keep working on our resentments. And and so how do we go about doing that actually? Well, it says in the next paragraph on page 67, we avoid retaliation or argument. We wouldn't treat a sick friend that way. If we do, we destroy our chance of being helpful. We cannot be helpful to all people, but at least God will show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. So as we go about this praying and dealing with people that we have resentments against, we're working on our resentment to them. If we can get rid of our resentment to them, if they don't buy it, if they're still angry at us, if they still don't like us, if, 
if they still want to argue with us, that's their problem. That's their thing. They have to, you know, they have to do that just because we're going to forgive them, just because we're not going to have our resentment against them, just because we're not going to be angry with them, doesn't mean that they're going to stop being angry with us. Or it doesn't mean that they're going to change their behavior. The thing we have a resentment against them for is something they may not change. We can't do anything about that. All we can do is clean our side of the street and ask God to show us how to take a kindly and tolerant view of each and every one. So what do we do next? Well, it says on page 67, next paragraph down, it says, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. We cannot fix what they did wrong. We cannot change people, places, and things. We can only change ourselves. So we look at our own mistakes. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? Okay, there's our, our four categories that we're looking at. This selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened. And it will find out that a lot of the reason we have resentments is because we were trying to get something done. We were approaching a situation, and the people that we were approaching didn't agree with us. They thought there was something else wrong. They thought things were different, and they didn't, they didn't want to come around. They didn't want to fix it. But we have to fix it inside ourselves. We're the ones that are going to, if we don't get the resentments fixed, we're the ones that are going to go out and have the drink, not them. So we're trying to keep ourselves from going out and, and getting drunk, and we're trying to establish a spiritual experience and grow that spiritual experience and maintain that spiritual experience. Remember, step 12 says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the steps, so here's where our spiritual awakening and our spiritual experience happens is in these steps, in step four, in step five, six, seven, eight, nine, and on through. Those steps are where we learn about our spiritual experience and our spiritual awakening, and that's how we build it, by building our faith, getting rid of fears, getting rid of our resentments, and all through the things that we're going to talk about in, in the next week or so in step four. Though the, a situation had not been entirely our own fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? Now, the old saying in AA is when you're pointing one finger at somebody else, there's three more pointing back at you. So, we can try to blame somebody else for what happened, but really we contributed so much to it that we're at fault too, and we have to see what we did, how we encouraged the, the resentment, how we caused this resentment to come about. All of this stuff we have to work out in ourselves through prayer meditation with our higher power and work on getting rid of our resentments. Where were we to blame? Well, the inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. So that's why you're writing down your resentments on a list. And this is to further go down more on that list and add more information to that list. We write our resentment list in the basic form that we showed on page 65, and then we add to that list. And if you look back to that thing, uh, that uh, chart on page 65, if you look in the column, the third column where it says affects my, you see where it says uh, on Mr. Brown, it says self-esteem, and in parentheses it has fear. Uh, the next thing, you know, he told my wife of my mistress, 
self-esteem, has fear written around it, has fear in parentheses after it. The guy may take my job. Well, there's self-esteem again with fear behind it. Self-esteem again with fear. Self-esteem, more fear, all the way down through the employer, the wife, everywhere, where there's security, whether there's self-esteem, whether there's sex relations, whether anything, anything that went along always brings fear because we're fear-based. And that's going to be our next list when we get further on. We're going to talk about fear and uh, why, why we had fear and what to do about our fears. So, in that last paragraph on page 67, it says, Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. This short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. So, imagine a shirt, and you take a needle and thread, and you soak the thread in acid, and sew it through your shirt. What happens to the shirt? The acid eats it up, eats holes in it. It makes it useless. You can't wear the shirt anymore. It's falling apart around you. It's no good anymore. So the acid destroys the shirt. So, fear is an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it, so our whole existence was full of holes caused by fear because we're fear-based. Those fears cause us to get angry. If somebody causes us fear, we get mad at them. And we go back and say, listen, you're making me mad. You're scaring me. You know, I'm mad at you now. And what do we get? We get self-pity. Why is everybody always picking on me? And we get a little self-pity going. And we lie. We say, well, that wasn't me. I didn't mean to do that. You know, that was somebody else did that and made me think that. It wasn't me. And, and we try to lie our way out of it. And we say, oh, well, I thought something else happened and that's why I was mad. But, you know, we, we always make an excuses. And we have, to, we have to stop that because it's ruining our lives. The next sentence is a powerful sentence. This sentence I've read a million times and it's so true. It says, fear. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. But did we not did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. So fear is a big deal. Fear sets in motion our other character defects, which is selfishness, dishonesty, and resentment. Fear makes us angry. Fear makes us lie. Fear makes us selfish and self-pitying. So all of that is brought about by fear. Our resentments are poison because when we're mad, we'll go and drink again. But when we're afraid, we'll just get more resentments. Fear makes us build our resentments up. We've, that's why we have to work so hard in this section to get rid of our fear so that we can get rid of our resentments. The first paragraph on page 68 says, We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. So on our, resent, on our fears list, which comes next, when we write our fears list, we're going to have fears on there that are not connected to the people, places, and things that we have resentments against. There's some fears that are standalone fears, things that we're afraid of inside ourselves, not caused by anybody else, only caused by us, only our thinking and the way we do things. So we're going to have, we're going to have fears that have no resentment in connection with them. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Self-reliance 
you know, relying on yourself throughout my entire career, I always, you know, relied on myself. And guess what? It got me in more and more trouble all the time. It wrecked me. It, it made a mess of my life because my self-reliance couldn't go enough. I couldn't be honest enough in my self-reliance. I couldn't get rid of fears and anger because my self-reliance wouldn't do that. So my self-reliance failed. Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-reliance, but that didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. So, we made our resentment list. The first thing we did in step four is make our resentment list, and we found a solution to our resentments, how to get rid of each resentment one at a time by praying for that person and praying that they get everything that they want and need. And we asked that, and we asked God to give us tolerance, patience, and pity for these people and understand that they're sick too. They're as sick as we are. Therefore, there's not much we can do except pray for them. And God will help us get a better outlook towards them. You're not going to change them, but you're going to have a better outlook for them. We don't fight with them. We don't retaliate. We don't try to get even. We don't do any of that. That's not how we would treat a sick friend. We wouldn't get mad at somebody because they had cancer or because they had COVID. So we can't do that. And... Some people, we won't be able to help. Some people, it won't help them. It won't fix them. It won't make them better. But we can show them a kindly and tolerant view, each and every one of them. And if we can do that and start treating, stop treating them like we're angry and start treating them like we love them as we should, we'll get better. So, the next paragraph starts out saying, perhaps there's a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis. <clears throat> the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play a role he assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity, which is fears and resentments, with serenity, which is peace and joy and love, tolerance, patience, and understanding. And we'll get, dig deeper in that next week and also go on to the next list on our, um, let's and finish up how it works. So thank you all for listening and um, see you next week.